So, hello, I'm Galen. This is So You Want to Hack on Rail Data. And so the kind of rough thought here is that the British train industry were quite lucky in how much data they publish just for anyone to hack on. But unfortunately, there's also a lot of it, which means it can be kind of intimidating. So I wanted to kind of just do a bit of like a sampler course of like what's out there and hopefully you'll find something interesting in here that you can make something with. Also, full disclosure, I found out I was doing this talk on Tuesday, so if it sounds like I'm unprepared, I am. So, starting from the beginning, timetables. If you want to know what trains are meant to run, there's one data feed for this is called the schedule feed, fair enough. It's published by Network Rail, the organization that run, that own the train tracks and do all of the signaling and scheduling. This, it's in this kind of horrible ASCII format called CIF. It, I promise it's not actually that bad. It's, you can see there's on top, there's the UID, that's the ID for the schedule. You can see it's running from this date to that date on weekdays only, that's five ones and then two zeros for the weekends. There's also a head code, which is a different identifier for the train because if there's one thing the British train industry can't do, it's have one ID for one thing. Um, then you can see on the left, there's all the places this train goes through. There's these times, which are the working times, those are the internal times for within the train industry, and then the public times, which are the times they publish. Usually they match, sometimes they're a few minutes off. And then you can see some of these have two times, that's the ones that stop there and then leave, and then leave a few minutes later. There's also places that the train just passes through without stopping, those have a pass time instead. Um, there is also a JSON version of this feed that is potentially slightly nicer to deal with. Unfortunately, JSON is impossible to fit on a slide, so you're getting this instead. But yeah, there's a JSON version. If you want to use that, it works just as well. Um, other thing about this is it's in this layered structure, so to handle things like engineering works or Christmas where they're not running the normal trains. You have the main schedule, which is marked with a P over there at the end for permanent. And then you have one or more overlays, which have the same ID and then, but then slightly different details, which then, which then replace that on a different set of date, a more limited set of dates. And then there's also these C for cancellation, which just means the train's not running that day. This isn't necessarily a cancellation in the traditional, you show up on the day and the train's not running. It's this train normally runs on this day, but was never meant to run on this particular day. So that's the kind of what's called the long, the long-term plan and the short-term plan for those like temporary overrides. There's also what's called the very short-term plan, which is when they decide like the day of that they're running an extra train. There's a separate data feed for this, which is just a stream of JSON messages. It's only available in JSON, so, and it's not the same JSON as the one before. So enjoy parsing that if you're very curious about, it's very, if you're curious about every single train. If you just want a rough idea, the other feed is probably fine. There's also a different timetable published by National Rail, or the Rail Delivery Group, who call themselves National Rail, the association of all the passenger train companies, which is roughly the same format, but it only has passenger trains, no freight trains, and it also has some extra stuff. For instance, they've added in some buses that show up in the train timetable time table you can use train tickets on. There's also some various other information in here, like what's called fixed links, where if there's two stations that you're allowed to walk between as part of a train journey, like across Glasgow or taking the tube across London, that's there's the data for all of the places you're allowed to do that. There's also data on how long you have to connect, at, how long you have to leave for a connection at a given station. At big stations, you have to wait longer for connections than, than small stations. So if you're wanting to kind of like build, if you're wanting to kind of look at possible passenger journeys, this is the data you'd want to be using. So that's timetables. Moving on, by the way, there will be a link with links for all of these at the end. Moving on to train status. So. It's all well and good knowing what trains are meant to be running. What are the trains actually doing? The, again, I'm going to start with the data Network Rail puts out. They put out this, they have a system called Trust, which is what they use to determine what trains ran. Mostly it's used for after the fact, looking at, okay, this train's been delayed, why? And so it's not really designed to be used in real time, which means you might have trains that pass a point, but you only hear that they pass the point later when a person goes and puts it in. So you can use it for real-time data, it's not great. But yeah, it's this, it gives you, the open data gives you this stream of JSON messages. You get this on the left, which is activating a train, so when a train's about to leave, you get um, 
you get the train's UID from before and its trust train ID because like I said, we cannot have one set of IDs, that'd be too easy. And then on the right, that's also labeled train activation. Oops, but that's a train actually moving. You can see it's giving you the train ID and it's told, telling you it's left a location with this ID. Again, new kind of station ID because that's how we roll. And I don't actually talk about it, but there is a database called Corpus that just gives you all of the different IDs for locations. So it's annoying, but not actually that bad. But, so like I said, trust helps, but it's not always on, but it's not always real time and it's sometimes won't give you information at all because only, it'll only include certain principal stations, it won't include every stop it passes. If you want more detail, there's what's called the train describers, which are, um, this comes from something in a signaling center, which the signalers use to keep track of what trains are where, and we have data for where, we have data coming out of, I think, most or all of the train describers in the country that lets us create things like this. This is something, this is a website called Open Train Times, built by Pogs, who is somewhere around at EMF, um, and is showing the data from this feed. You can see kind of the trains by head code in where, in this is Edinburgh Waverley Station, you can see where every single train is. And this is also available as a JSON feed. You get these very straightforward messages saying a train with this head code has moved from this location to this location. Unfortunately, those location numbers are inscrutable and poorly documented. My understanding is that the community has a pretty good, has done a pretty good job of reverse engineering this, but it is definitely not straightforward, unfortunately. Also, I say that it has head codes. It in fact has any four characters. And so sometimes signalers will do things like type in very wet use boat instead of anything useful because the lines close anyway, may as well have fun. But so, and so you can use the train describers and trust to get a pretty good picture of where every train is on the network, but that's a lot of work and you probably don't want to do that. If you just want passenger trains, there's a simpler approach. There's a thing called Darwin, which is the system that belongs to National Rail, or the Rail Delivery Group, who, which provides the passenger facing information. So this is the information that shows up in every train company's app on the departure boards. It's the standard passenger facing information for the whole country. And it gives you this feed of XML messages that tells you like, so this is what's called a schedule message, so it's introducing a new train or updating the schedule for a train if something happened. For instance, this is an update because all the stops after a given point have been cancelled for reason 555, which is unexploded bomb near the railway. This is a train that I was on trying to get here. Um, so you have these schedule messages which are... So you have these, these schedule messages for the schedules themselves, but then for the actual running data, there's what's called a train status message, which gives you, which tells you just, it's specifically for a few locations, what the current estimated time is, and I don't think there's any unique example, but if a train, when a train actually does a thing, you'll get a status message with the actual time that it happened, and so we can see this train is now estimated to get to Haymarket at 8.51, it was scheduled for 8.50, and then there's also updated times for the next few stations after that. So this is not bad, so Darwin is not bad at all. You can just subscribe to the feed and keep track of, and keep track of the status of every, every train on the network. It is a lot of work if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to know where every train in the country is at a given time. In that case, there's something called the Darwin Live Departure Board web service. It is a very nice, straightforward SOAP API. SOAP, which if you've not dealt with SOAP, good for you, but it's this kind of old 2000s REST precursor. It's a little scary, but it's really not bad. You post XML to an HTTP endpoint and you ask it, for instance, get me the next departures from Ledbury in the next 120 minutes. Oh yes, there's another type of way of identifying a station because we cannot be consistent. And it comes back with a list of trains. So if you're just wanting to see, like get the status of a particular train or get the trains leaving from one station, this can be a very quick, straightforward way to do it. I've used this, it's great. The one annoying thing about it is that the signup form is currently broken. So if you want to sign up for this, or at least the useful version of it, you have to send an email and hear back in a few business weeks 
about with an API key. It works, but it's annoying. There's also a third-party proxy that mostly works and also gives you JSON. I, that's called Huxley, and I mention it in the link at the end. That can be a very straightforward way if you just want train status. So there's, there's, uh, there's the timetables. There's train status. That's kind of the two big things. Let's move on to some more fun esoteric things, like, or uh, infrastructure is not esoteric, but there's less, there's definitely been a lot less stuff done here. Um, so this is kind of looking at data about like, not necessarily what trains are running, but what train network exists, what trains could you theoretically run. There's a very cool data set that they released called Bplan, that's the train net, that's the like, what they use for planning train timetables. So it tells you it's got a list of all the locations on the network. It's got a list of which locations are connected to each other. So you can see there's Ledbury is connected to the next station over called Colwall, and that they are, what, six kilometers apart from each other. And then it also has the timings for every type of train between those two stops. So this is a five car and a nine car class 802, the trains Great Western Railway uses. And then there's different times depending on whether or not it's stopping at one station or the other. Because if you're stopping at a station, you'll spend, long, so you'll spend longer getting between them because you're accelerating or decelerating. So you can see that in this case, it's the same for a five car or a nine car. It takes five minutes and 30 seconds. If you're, stopping, if you're not stopping at one of the stations, if you're stopping at both stations, it takes six minutes. In this case, they must just never run trains that, stop at, but that don't stop at either because there's no time for that. So this data works, but it's a little iffy if you're trying to sort out stuff that hasn't been done because they only have the timings they need. There's also this, which I've not played with in too much detail, but looks very cool, which is called the ITPS network model, which is just this giant XML file that gives you in detail the shape of the entire train network. Unfortunately, it's still a schematic model. You can't actually get convert this into latitude and longitude on a map, but you can see like the exact structure of like individual tracks and signals and get a very good picture of what the train network looks like. Moving on to what I'm calling reliability and disruption. So data about, I'm going way too fast, oh gosh. Um, so information about when things have gone wrong, what's gone wrong, etc. There's one data set that I've played a lot with called the delay attribution data. So this is coming from the process under which basically when a train runs late, they figure out who has to pay for it. But you can, as a result of that, get this super detailed picture of like what goes wrong when there are train delays. So we can see, I picked this example of, a, there was quote unquote disorder at Birmingham International that delayed a train by 10 minutes. Then there was another train that was delayed by nine minutes because the crew from the first train were meant to be on that train. That's quote unquote inward crew. And then there was another train that was delayed by two minutes because it got held at a junction to let that train go by and then two other trains that were delayed by being behind that train that was late. So you get these like huge chain reactions of train delays and there's a lot of fun that can be done with that. And I don't think there's been a lot of stuff done with this data, so there's a lot of room to play with there. Also, if you just want a big picture of like, are the trains running well, there's, you may have seen this page on the National Rail website that just has a list of ongoing incidents. There's an API for that. You can just get a list of everything that has, that is currently going wrong. Unfortunately, none of this is machine readable. It's all text. So there's probably not that much you can do. There's probably a limit to how much fun you can have with it, but you can still probably, you can go based on train company. You could probably grep for station names and you can probably have a pretty good, just like something's gone wrong alerting service. So there's some, there's some stuff, fun stuff to play with there. Moving on to fares, if you want to know how much your train journey is going to cost, there's the British train system has a very complicated fare system, and, but unusually almost all of the data from it is public. So we can see here, I'm looking at, this is, so the fares database is just this giant text file that you can download, and so it's an annoying ASCII format. You get used to them, they're not that bad. And it's here, it's declaring a flow, which is a pair of stations, in this case that's Birmingham to Ledbury, and it's giving it an ID, and then it's defining a bunch of fares for that flow. And so it's giving a fare type, which is those three characters in green, and then a price in pence. 
So we can, and then I've annotated with the names of the fair types on the right. So you can see that in any time day return from Birmingham to Ledbury is 19 pounds and zero pence. There is a bunch more data that I'm not showing that actually declares like the names of all these fair types and what they mean, which is a giant mess to interpret. There's also a bunch of fair types that aren't actually tickets, things like a ticket, a first class upgrade, or a ticket that lets you take a surfboard on a train. And unfortunately, there is no very clean way I've found to distinguish these. You just have to write a lot of edge cases. So it works. You can get some stuff without too much detail, but handling it well is unfortunately a giant pain. There's also on the fares front this data set called the routing guide. That's the rules for if I have a ticket from point A to point B how, what train, what routes am I allowed to take to get there, which is its own very complicated document that one could spend 30 minutes talking about, but the very short version is between pairs of stations, it gives you a list of quote unquote maps, and then these maps on the right, I'm showing the official site, but you can get all of these like lines between points in the data set. It shows you like what lines you're allowed to follow on this given map, and then you just put the maps together to get the route between two stations. And so, if you know what this means, it's potentially very interesting. If not, you could learn what it means and potentially find it interesting, but it is a fairly niche thing, but interesting in its own right. Moving on to one last thing, train usage. So if you're curious how many passengers are on trains, they've very recently released this data set called the origin destination matrix, which shows the number of passengers between any two stations on the network. So last year, between Ledbury and Hereford, there were 37,000 passengers, all the way down to one passenger who went from Ledbury to Glen Eagles in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, I think this would have been an EMF year, so I suspect a lot of these weird trips are EMF. Um, and so this data is a little bit inaccurate because it's based on ticket data and often you can't exactly look at a ticket and figure out what journeys someone would have made. For instance, if you have a ticket from Ledbury to Birmingham, it'll be good to any of the three stations in Birmingham. And so it takes a guess and guesses most of them went to New Street, some of them went to Moore Street, some of them went to Snow Hill. That's probably wrong because there is no good way to get from Ledbury to Birmingham, Moore Street. So I suspect they've done this poorly. So if, the data, if this data looks silly, take it with a grain of salt. But there's still a lot of very interesting stuff you can do. This came out quite recently, so I think we've still yet to see a lot of what people do with this. But there's a potential for a lot of very interesting stuff there. So that's it for my rough whirlwind tour. Hopefully some of that sounded sufficiently interesting that you want to keep playing with it. If so, I have this page that I've made with links to all the data sets I was talking about. Also extremely good resources from the community. There's the Open Rail Data Wiki and the Open Rail Data Google Group. There is an extremely good community that can and will help you if you have any questions. They've helped me a lot and I imagine they will help you a lot too. It's a really great community and there's a lot of fun to be had. So thank you. <laughs>